Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Audio bandwidth for Net at Night is provided by AOL Music and Spinner.com, where you can get free MP3s, exclusive interviews, and more. Video bandwidth for Net at Night is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y.com. This is Net at Night with Amber MacArthur and Leo Laporte, episode 156, recorded June 22, 2010. Ping.com. Net at Night is brought to you by Go to Assist Express. If you're in tech support, solve problems fast with the leader in remote support software. Go to Assist Express for a free 30-day trial. Visit gotoassist.com slash night. It's time for Net at Night from Petaluma, California in the U.S. of A. I am Leo Laporte. And I'm Amber MacArthur from Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Hello, Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Hello, Leo. I missed you last week, but Sarah was great. Yeah, we were at uh, E3. And I was exhausted on Tuesday because Tuesday, I think I had to get up early and 5 a.m. And oh, it was crazy. We had a crazy yeah. schedule there, but it was a lot of fun. I, you know, I, I'm a gamer, kind of a closet gamer. Yeah. I'm not like, you know, there's people, really hardcore people like Paul Theron on Windows Weekly who like 10th prestige on Call of Duty, you know, and he's like, it's done. I've played the entire game, every level, every possible achievement. I don't have time. I don't know how Paul has time for that. I don't have time for that. So I play a level here, level there. But I do love games. And that's how I got into technology in the first place was gaming. So it's really fun to go there. The only thing that depresses me a little bit is how little originality there is in gaming. Oh, really? It's all yeah. about sequels. And even in the hardware, it was like everybody's copying Nintendo. You know, huh. Microsoft's Kinect was kind of their response to the Nintendo Wii. And then Sony has the, the Wii, Move, yeah. which is just like a Wii. And and it was it was it's as if it's when there's so much money at stake in something, people are less likely to take chances. And I would think, yeah, they're also less creative, you know. Yeah. Just uh, yeah, that's interesting. I never thought of it from that point of view, but you're right. I mean, it, that's kind of the biggest news that I heard out of uh, E3 was talking about Connect, and I think you're you know just all seems as though it's all in the same area, the same type of game. Well, and gaming uh, is it's so expensive now. It's as it's much to make a, a, a video, a, a big video game as a uh, as a movie. It's hundreds of millions of dollars. So uh, they're not going to take a chance. They do a sequel because they know, hey, everybody loved Dead Rising. We'll do Dead Rising 2. Everybody loved Left 4 Dead. We'll do Left 4 Dead 2. Everybody loved <laughs> Halo. We'll do Halo 3. I mean, it, you know, it's just kind of, so everything's sequels, you know, even you know, the big excitement was, oh, Mortal Kombat is back. It's like, yeah, great. Well, okay. You know? It's just like Hollywood. Like all the big it's mainstream like movies Hollywood. are kind of the same. You know, we've seen them all. The same romantic comedies, exactly. all the sequels to the action movies. And I the think Bourne it's for the identity. same. It's for the same reasons. It's there's too much uh, money at stake. They can't take a chance. Now, what what what's good though is apps and these little casual games like Farmville. Um, are where innovation is happening, are where some interesting stuff is happening. So that's because they're less expensive to make. They're potentially, I mean, look how much money Zynga is making off of its Facebook games. It's unbelievable. Right? Yeah. I can't, uh, we so, have to have them on the show. Yes, I'd love to get Mark Pincus on. Uh, they're brilliant. And of course, they're coming to the uh, iPad and the iPhone. Well, they already yeah. have on the iPhone, but they're apparently coming to the iPad with uh, another Farmville not that I'm a Farmville player anymore. I got off of it when I got off Facebook, but I am. I do have a little farm. <laughs> uh, uh, actually, it's a little village that I, I put together on my uh, I, iPad. It's called, it's We Rule is the name of the game. And, um, you know, my mom, I've got my mom hooked on it. Yeah, I know. We talked about that before. Your yeah. mom is into it. Yeah. And it's fun. It's really fun. So, uh, and I understand that they're doing a, a, a We Rule they're going to extend this to the city. So now they have We Rule, which is like the country, right? Mm -hmm. And I have my crops and my barn and, you know, my castle. And apparently they're going to do a city or something like that. They're going to do uh, another realm. So, and you know what's interesting about these games, the model for these games, first of all, obviously they're very simple, but they're free for the most part. Farmville's free. They make all their money with in-game purchases, people buying bits Oh, I, I've got to build something, you know, or I've got to have a stall for my horse or whatever. And so they spend literally real money for fake things. 
It's kind of funny. I can imagine the first person who ever thought up that business model and they presented it to someone. I'm sure people laughed in their faces and thought, there's no way people are going to buy virtual right. things. I mean, I would have thought that. And then all of a sudden you see people just get obsessed with these games and just spend so much money on them. And it, I mean, I guess it, for some people, it's just a hobby, a fun hobby. It's like model trains or something. I mean, look, this is a little model, isn't it, that I've made of my little town? It's just like a model train, except it's easier. It's more casual. I don't need to put so much effort into it. I just drag things around with my finger. So I can, you know, it is appealing in a way because it's very casual. I don't have hours to spend, but I like something I could check into periodically. And of course, I love being God to these little people. <laughs> Whoa, I am their I'm Lord and Master. Hey, Leo, now you're scaring me. What happened to you <laughs> hey, who are we talking to on the show today? Well, I'm really excited to have one of the co-founders of Ping on our show today. You know, we're always talking about the next big thing. And uh, Ping, for people who haven't tried it out, it's kind of like an Evite killer. So many people have been using Evite for years and years and years, but it's ugly and I think it's getting worse. It's almost going the way of MySpace. And uh, Ping is a competitor, very big on the social side as far as integration with Twitter and Facebook and more. So the co-founder is going to come on and talk more about it with us and talk about uh, how they're changing and mixing up the online invitation world. It's not ping FM. It's P-I-N-G-G dot com, right? Exactly. There's so many pings in the web 2.0 world. <laughs> well, before we get to Lorian of P-I-N-G-G dot com, uh, we do have a couple of uh, interesting notes, including uh, Google in the news. Yeah, you know, this is kind of a rumor right now. Uh, Google is planning to uh, launch an iTunes competitor. So they're getting in on the music game on the web and uh, they'll have some type of download service. There's not a lot of details around this. I did some searching just to dig up information. Um, people are speculating that they need a music service for their Android smartphones to compete. Right now with you use Amazon. If, you, if you're going to like uh, all of the Android phones, there's an Amazon application, and if you use like Double Twist, which I use to sync to the Android phone, it has an app store. It very looks much looks like iTunes, but of course Google's getting none of that money. Amazon's getting the money. Yeah, I mean, I think it makes sense for them to get in on the action there. And, you know, I was reading on the Wall Street Journal article about this topic that they said it would be tied into search somehow as well. Of course. Um, I, again, not a lot of details. Uh, it's kind of, a, it's funny, Leo, if you ever watch uh, when breaking news happens on television and really the reporting about what they don't know, this story is kind of like this. You More know, we, we don't, don't know, know this, we don't know we this. We don't know when, we don't know how. It feels a little bit like that. Yeah. And so when, when Google comes out with news like this, it's funny. It reminds me of, um, I think it was Google Books or, I can't remember, we were talking about this before and there was very little information out about it. And uh, and we just sort of, you know, end up talking about it because the, the buzz is there online, but there's just no details. And this fits, falls in to that same category. Well, anything that Google does becomes a big story just because oh, they're okay. so big. And like Apple and like Microsoft, they can change the course, the direction of rivers, you know, by, by deciding what business they want to be in. But this is kind of like the gaming business where it's uh, a, a copycat, right? I mean, yeah. Apple already has this. In fact, Apple has proven, I, I think when Apple started iTunes, everybody thought, ah, oh. the music companies gave them a sweetheart deal because they thought, well, we'll, we'll be a fun experiment. It's not going to not gonna replace our retail businesses. It's not going to replace, but it did. It's the number one music retailer in the country. So now everybody's saying, well, how do we, well, quick, catch Apple. <laughs> and I, I'd almost hate to see that. I, almost, I would almost prefer to see some real innovation. Yeah, and you know what? Who knows? I mean, maybe they have something up their sleeve, but I think you're right. They're just going to come out with a service that's very similar to iTunes and uh, try to get their piece of the pie, but uh, not a whole lot of innovation happening, which is sad for Google because I think they're one company that I would expect more from and expect more in innovation on their side. Well, maybe they'll surprise us. Maybe there is some secret sauce that they've thought of that we haven't thought of. Who Fingers knows? crossed, Leo. Fingers crossed. All right, so this next headline is kind of funny. Uh, it talks about breaking up on Facebook. And the reason I wanted to include this is, it's so funny. Every once in a while, I have a call from a friend or an email, and they'll say, hey, did you see what my ex just posted on Facebook? Yep. And it's funny because I don't really live in that world. I mean, I don't have the, that type of relationship where everything is kind of drama, and I would post things on Facebook that, you know, oh, we're not together anymore. I mean, I'm very stable in that sense. But even just but, changing your status, like from, I know. from married to single, I had a friend who did that, and it was like... <gasps> <laughs> oh, and people just lose it. Leo, the funny thing is on Facebook, on my personal account, it still says single. And the only reason I haven't changed it is because obviously I'm not single. I haven't been single forever. But the reality is I don't want to go in and change it because I don't want, you know, people to <gasps> notice and say, oh, what happened? Are you married? And then all of a sudden I have this flood of comments about that topic. But uh, you know what my solution is? 
Yeah. Quit Facebook. Quit Facebook. <laughs> it together. worked. I, I, can, <laughs> I don't have to state anything. You, know, you don't have to. I, yeah. This is staggering, though, Leo. This is, if you weren't going to leave Facebook before, this might be one reason you want to leave. Um, so this is a, a, a study that was done by a Facebook dating app called Are You Interested? And they surveyed about 1,000 people. So not too many, but 25% of respondents said that they found out about their own relationship ending by seeing it on Facebook. How many? 25%. <gasps> That's horrible. That's worse than getting texted. It really is. And I don't want to reveal who these people are in my life, but I will say I have a couple of people very close to me who have Facebook fights all the time. They are broken up, but in terms of what each oh. person is posting, I mean, it's just, it gets really, really Chris, ugly. Chris really Perillo and his wife, when they broke up, you could tell it was coming because they would be fighting in their blogs. He would post a blog post. Oh my gosh. I know. It was kind of unseemly. It was like, oh, but they. Uh, this is how, you know, a lot of people live now is in, in public. Yeah, I suppose so. I guess that would never occur to me. I mean, even this is another stat from the study that 35% of respondents say they have used Facebook statuses to make someone think they have plans when they really don't. Just, <laughs> yes, I'm going out tonight, not I'm washing my hair tonight, that. Yeah, I love it. <laughs> I know. And then I'm thinking one of two things. One is I'm just not that calculating. And two is my life just isn't that interesting. So I have no need to do these type of updates. Yeah. Wow. Wow. <laughs> but kind of funny in, in the long run. Yeah. It's, uh, it's this, well, you know, Amber's the uh, author of this book, Power Friending. And, uh, and really, I guess in a way, that's what we're talking about here is the, is the culture, the society is changing and has been changed by these social media. I mean, it, how we relate is changing. It's just kind of scary. Yeah, I think, I mean, especially for personal relationships, so much has changed in the past few years with all of these social sites. I mean, I tend to look at it more from a business perspective and how you can connect with customers. But in our everyday lives, I mean, it, it's funny because even with me, there are certain people in my life who are good friends of mine, but because they're not part of any of these social networks, I don't know anything that's happening. And I never think of picking up the phone and calling them. So oh, I'm, now they're left out. They're really left out. And so oh. relationships that were once very strong can become very weak if you don't have that digital tie. So you think uh, that by dropping Facebook, I've like kind of severed my tie to a whole bunch of people? I guess I have. Leo, I you might that. have, yes. Because, <laughs> well, my, you know, Kathy Creeley, my very first girlfriend, um, you know, we connected back again on Facebook after 35 years. Uh, and that's how we were staying in touch. She can't poke me anymore. I just had no comment. <laughs> <laughs> But I no, realize it's not. She's not going to send me an email. She's not no, going to call. She's not going to text message me. Facebook allows these very casual, ad hoc relationships to be maintained easily. You're exactly right. I mean, I have a few friends who are not really close friends. They were sort of, you know, in, the, in, in a different circle, but we know each other and I'm up to date on, you know, they just had kids and I see pictures of their sons or daughters and that allows me just to have that loose connection. But there's no way I'm going to call or email them. But on Facebook, I know we have this sort of tie, even though maybe it's not actually real in the well, physical world. Yeah, that begs the question. Important. Is it a real relationship if it's just a Facebook relationship or is it just Facebook reduces the friction so much that you stay in touch with people that you would normally not? Stay in touch. See, I think, and this is one thing that I mentioned at the beginning of my book, and this is one of the reasons I wrote the book, is because I think that even the definition of a friend has changed because of the internet. And I think that, you know, even though you have a loose tie to someone, I think you can even kind of consider that you do have a relationship there. And that's very different in terms of how we used to consider relationships. Like there are people who I know on Twitter and I'll just casually to Chris say, oh, my friend on Twitter can help us out. You know, he runs a music store or whatever it might be. And Chris is like, have you ever met them? And I'm thinking, no. no. But I I still like I still but they're useful and you can that. still call on them yeah, and I might consider them closer to me it's than networking. people who I've known for 25 years <laughs> you know it's, it's very different but interesting I mean it's, it's interesting to take that view and look at it from how it's evolved over the years and how relationships have changed I'm now very confused and conflicted in some ways I feel like it's blackmail and that's what like makes me glad that I left Facebook because it's it's kind of phony f engagement but I don't think it is. I don't think it is it for isn't. everybody. Well, that's the it's th not. Mm. So, I think it's real for But a then lot of I people. feel blackmailed because the only way to do it is through this company and support their policies, which I don't support. And I don't want to do that. So now what? I can't have friends? <laughs> I'm not allowed to have friends because I won't be part of the Facebook ecosystem? But Leah, what do you think about the new privacy protection that they're offering? I mean, it, making that doesn't it easier. assuage me. You know what? I will never no. forgive Facebook for one simple thing. 
they took my interests. You know that paragraph you say, what are your interests? Mm -hmm. They took them and forced me publicly to join groups that match my interests. I had no choice. Mm -hmm. I couldn't say no. There was nothing to do about it. And if my, you know, that's, that is a, a hideous violation of my privacy that was un, un, there was no warning. There was no option to get out of it. You had no choice. If that was the <laughs> only thing they did, yeah, don't you remember that? When you went onto Facebook after that change, all of a sudden it says we've subscribed you to these 12 public groups that are based on your interests. I don't even remember that. Yeah, well, it yeah, did. Yeah, I, I guess it might have happened. I don't remember yeah, that Yeah, it at did. All. Look at what groups you're members of. Uh, somebody, mm. In fact, we had somebody in here uh, who was saying that um, he, he had said in, in his interest something like, I don't know, comma, and I don't care. And he was subscribed. They created two new groups, one called I don't know, another one called and I don't care. Oh my so God. even if there aren't groups, they would, they would make you a member of it. That to me was, the, was it. It, I will, I, it. That was like, goodbye, Facebook, and I will never have anything to do with you again. Now, I should point out, I did create a Facebook account. People are trying to friend me on this account only because I wanted to see what the default... I want to keep track of, because I cover it, what the default settings are for privacy on Facebook uh, as those okay. are changed. So I do not, do, I, I don't have any interest on that account. I don't make any friends on that account. It's just an account that I can go into and see what the current default settings are. That's, so if you say, well, I see your account, that's what that account is. But I am not active on Facebook and I find it reprehensible what they did. Still. You know what's interesting, Leo? I had a really good conversation with this woman in the U.S. who is, I think she's one of the main PR people at Facebook. And we were just talking about the new privacy settings and things that they were doing. And I had about an hour long chat with her. It was wonderful. And she was sort of defending um, their, their why they were doing what they were doing and how they were uh, conducting business. And I'd love to have someone like her on the show or someone else from oh, Facebook yeah. on the show to I'm talk about to this. Because I mentioned, uh, I mentioned you to her and I said, you know, I wish that Leo was on this call right now so he could hear some of these things and hear how you're making changes and, and what's happening well, inside the company. And Kara Swisher and uh, Walt Mossberg had Mark Zuckerberg on stage at D8, asked him the question that I just brought up. Walt asked him. Mark dodged it three times, did not answer it, did not respond to it, did not say why they did it. They, their drumbeat is people want to be connected. We're going to help them connect. People want to be connected. We're going to help them connect. Uh, either, I don't know. I don't care what their intent is, whether they get it or not. It's an accident and intentional. They're nice people. It doesn't matter to me. Uh, I think it's a evil platform and I don't want to be part of it. You know, I'm going to uh, go this weekend to Foo Camp, Friends of O'Reilly Camp, and a number of Facebook people, I think Dave Warren and uh, uh, Dave Recording will be there. And I'm, I'm absolutely willing and in, interested in engaging in a conversation with them. But mm -hmm. my mind is not going to be changed because they did something unforgivable and that's it. If a friend did that to me, I would, I would it'd be like, bye, see ya. And yeah, this, is a, really... this is a private company mm -hmm. that I, have, I don't have that kind of bond with. It's, you know what? I just, I missed that issue altogether. It's funny because I thought you had quit for other reasons. I mean, other privacy well, reasons. Well, there were but many, I many, 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 oh, many sure. reasons. But if I had to say, but, 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 but and, and a lot of people said, but, but look what Facebook's done. They've made it much easier, right, to protect your privacy. It's, so they're okay now, right? No. <laughs> not with me. But, and I also, it's not, I'm not leading a charge. I'm not in any way saying everybody should do this. I do think people should be aware of what they're doing when they engage with Facebook. But um, I've said my piece on that. I'm not trying to get anybody to leave Facebook by any means. And I know it's a, that's futile. <laughs> and, and, but my point here, and this all came from the point that you pay a price. It's so interesting because Facebook is a monopoly. They're the only one I've in a way disconnected from friends because I refuse to use this one platform. There's no alternative. Yeah, there's absolutely none. That's I mean, bad. That's something that should raise warning alarms for people. And I think in Canada, they had announced that now one in every two people in Canada is on Facebook, which is pretty phenomenal if you think about that 50 <laughs> percent of our population you know amber it's going to be 99 percent within the next five years everybody yeah. in fact this is what really scares me in the long run is that I, you know people are saying you're talking about facebook again but it, it should scare people that facebook is going to become the default presence on the net for everybody everybody and if you don't have a Facebook page, it'll be like not having an answering machine. I don't like that. That scares the hell out of me. Well, I think, and also, I mean, I my stance has always been people should be educated about what's going on there. And if they don't choose to join, then don't join. But I think the, the thing that people need to understand is that Facebook, and Facebook knows this, they're the only social network in the world where people actually share real information they about themselves. It. They tell the truth. They and own it. 
it's funny because if you look at any other social network, I mean, people use handles and usernames that aren't their own and they don't put their accurate information. But on Facebook, people put everything. It's like, you know, it's, they are very comfortable in that environment. And I don't necessarily think that is good for everybody. And, uh, um, and again, that's where I think the education part is really important. And my biggest complaint when I had a call with this woman from Facebook was that I think they needed to highlight the education more. I mean, they obviously have made it so complicated even to find anything, even with their new changes. I still think it's the whole system is complicated and people are just not aware and they don't do a lot to educate people about uh, sharing information and what you shouldn't share because um, maybe that's not necessarily in their best interest. <laughs> let's get our, uh, let's move on because I think we've done the Facebook thing and I, I'm sure yeah. that Lorian is going, come on, I want to come on the air. Lorian oh, yeah. Gable, is it Gable? Is co-founder of ping.com. Yeah. You know, he's in New York, but I have to warn you, he's Canadian. Oh man, you and your Sorry. Canadians. I'm sorry, it's just a coincidence. I'm just you. <laughs> We're taking over, Leo. Watch that border. Hey, Lauren. Unprotected border in the world. Hey, Lauren. <laughs> Lauren. Hi, how are you? Oh, great. It's Lorian, right? Uh, like Delorean without the duh. Like Delorean without the duh. Now that's good. <laughs> How's that? I like it. <laughs> it's a great the introduction. Well. <laughs> yeah. Welcome to Twit uh, and Net at Night. Well, tell us about Ping. Dot com. Um, we are what I hope um, people think is a better version, uh, a better way to use online invitations and create great looking invitations online and then manage your events. Um, and uh, it's been, uh, it's not exactly what you might say is cutting edge. Um, you know, people have been doing that for 10 plus years. Um, but I, I think that we've uh, found a better way to do that. You do it via uh, hard copy too, via email, by regular mail. Yeah. You know, we uh, um, using a market sample of one, which is probably always a bad sample to use. <laughs> Just, you know, I, 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 uh, as a guy, uh, maybe another bad, probably the worst example I can use. Um, I would never or rarely find a reason to go down and buy a print invitation and stamp it and mail it out. But I thought, huh, you know, if I could do that online easily, it would be sent out for me. You know, people could RSVP be online, click of a button. I might do that. I love um, that. I think that's really a nice feature. It and is. This, I love the is, idea of getting something in the mail. <laughs> and you have some beautiful art you could send. I mean, these these are not kind of canned by any means. These are beautiful. Yeah, it's not our art anymore. I mean, originally we started out with our own designs and then, you know, again, looking for a way to sort of distinguish ourselves from what's a pretty crowded market. Um, we had, uh, you know, I originally had uh, some friends who were artists and photographers here in New York. And they're like, hey, I'd love to, you know, get some of my stuff up on your site, just get my name out there a little bit. And I sort of didn't, I did not have an aha moment. And we added a couple of people and then Martha Stewart's an investor. And so she put some designs up. Um, but then we sort of, sort of, uh, you know, I like to think claim, uh, um, uh, this was, uh, my idea, but we just had an artist or photographer saying, Hey, I'd love to set up a profile. I'd love to be able to send my friends to use my art. Um, there's not many digital outlets. So we've decided to open up, um, essentially the platform to anyone who has creative content that could be used as e-cards or e invitations. Um, what, what percentage of your users use e-invitations and what percentage use hard copy? Uh, it's like 90% use e. Um, oh, too bad. Yeah. Oh, I love the idea of an actual no. mailed invitation. I think that's... Well, so well you see, mailed requires uh, money. So, oh, money. Oh, that. <laughs> <laughs> Don't love that idea. But Leo, okay, I encourage you if you haven't already, and Lorian, I have to tell you that usually when we talk to someone who hasn't been on the show before, Leo is actually playing around on the usually site. Usually I sign chatting. up right away, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you should, Leo, if you have a second while we're chatting, just sign up and try to use it because I had a chance to use it recently for an event that I was having in Toronto and I couldn't believe one, how easy it was. Uh, two, again, the integration with different social sites. Three, the way I could easily pull in my contacts from Gmail or any other email service. And literally within two minutes, I created this amazing event, automatic reminders the day before, thank you notes go out, out afterwards. I mean, they're just, are, there's those extra things that have been done, Lorraine, and I don't know who's behind all this, that just make it kind of special and make it more than just what we've known forever in the Evite system. Now, here's one so, problem. So, I, Leo, if you're not on Facebook anymore, you know, you're missing all that event spam. Oh, right? shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I don't, I don't get the, you know, I noticed you, you, it's very easy to do Facebook Connect, but it was really easy for right. me to set up, so. Right. So, yeah. let me, let me, uh, one, one thing that does worry me, and it's, uh, you know, I always bring this up. See, you, you got the paranoid here, Lorianne, just so you know. Um, 
There's just just because I'm paranoid doesn't mean you're not out to get me. <laughs> exactly. I always worry about evites, uh, e greetings, because what I'm doing in effect is giving a third party my friend's email address so that they can make the invitation. And it yeah. make it really makes me nervous. And I always tell people, boy, do not send do not send me electronic greetings because I don't want that third party. I don't care if it's Hallmark. I don't know what they're doing with my email address. And you don't either. And you shouldn't be giving um, my email address to them without asking me first. So, so our, our first company on the internet was one of the first commercial ISPs in Canada. Um, so uh, I think our we launched in late 1993 that was almost pre-browser not quite and so from an email you know just uh, i think this is probably reflective of anyone in this space but from ourselves just we're pretty cautious to we were there, you know we were before spam so as an isp dealing with spam you understand um, the hardship dealing with that the, is yeah i think the last the last thing we would do would be to email our our users guests i think that would be I, so you and, and you do have a I privacy link. Like you don't I share these. This, you don't yeah, share this in the space. Who did this? Yeah. I know someone did that. Yeah. Um, and uh, that would be the ultimate stupidity. I mean, we have a database of I don't know ten million email addresses because I guess, but there's nothing we would ever do with them. You say all. very explicitly, we will not make available, including without limitation, trading, selling, transferring any of the collected information to third parties. Yeah. Yeah, the only the only people we ever quote solicit on so is our own hosts with our once a month newsletter. So and we send a news which you can opt out, obviously, but right. we wouldn't never send that to our guests. Well, you know what I liked when I signed up that that was unchecked. It wasn't. It, it was by default opting out. So I like that also. Um, right. Yeah. So, so no, this. Yeah. But I, but I want to raise it because I think it's something that people. Uh, uh, it certainly always concern concern me a little bit. You know. People are pretty judicious with their emails. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, and you're giving out home addresses too if you're going to mail something. I love that. Now, now, okay, so it was free for me to sign up. Uh, now, uh, if I want, what's next? It says for free I can sign up for the Plus. What is the Plus account? So, um, you know, it's funny. Sometimes you actually have to earn money on the internet. I know it doesn't <laughs> seem like it very often, but once no, I, I and Amber will will verify this. I like sites that have a business model. Yeah, me too. That means it might be around in the future. Exactly. <laughs> You're very old fashioned. Um, <laughs> so we are, we do have a free service um, and that is ad supported. But then a lot of people don't like ads, which is one of the peop peop reasons people don't like Evite right. um, is because it's plastered in ads. So we have an optional upgrade, which is $10 an event. It's not a subscription or reoccurring fee. And for that, you get a number of things, including ad free. You also get a large guest list. You can customize the web address for um, your event landing page. Um, oh, that's neat. So I could have Leo. Oh, right. I, I could have like leo.ping.com slash my birthday party. Right, exactly. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. So we, we try to come up with um, a set of features which we thought that we could entice um, people who had maybe a more serious event or a more formal event to pay us $10, um, remove the ads. Um, and we get between 10 and 20%. Um, upgrade off that. So it's pretty good, actually. It's um, good. So we're relatively and, satisfied with that. And Leo, there's something that I know that you'll like that, which was sort of the moment for me where I thought, oh, I'm going to definitely use this service again. But uh, once you have your uh, event set up, then there's actually almost like a live feed where you can see as people click on invitations to open them and view them, they respond. So imagine there's just like a live feed of activity that's happening that you can see what people are doing with those invites oh, and if neat. they've said they're coming. And so all of those, so I, again, I'm going to kind of call them those social elements that we know and love in the, the new social web they're all integrated into this so from an event management standpoint uh, it just makes it easy and interactive and, and you just feel like you have a better grasp on what's happening I really love the design I mean there's such a huge number of designs it's really cool this yeah is, there are a lot that, I mean to well, me that this so, is the thing that really stands out about I mean this. we just wanted to you know essentially you know digital is never gonna quite be like print but we want to create an experience which you'd be happy creating and sending it and sort of impressed receiving it rather than, you know, a, uh, a, a some clip art which went to a web page. So right. something that gets people's invite. And that's the point of an invitation, frankly. So 
They're really great. I know my, I know ha- Jennifer would love these. You know? Oh, it's yeah. There's lots of really yeah. nice designs. How are you guys doing? I mean, as far as drawing over that uh, that crowd from the Evite world, because I know there's actually a site I think dedicated, if I'm correct, with hating Evite. Uh, Evite yes. people don't really like them. Um, so, how is it going for you guys as far as growth and the number of people using we're, the service? We're neck and neck with Facebook. Actually, it's very close. So oh, come on. Month, I think next month we'll pass Facebook. Or something like <laughs> come that. on. Like, well, so, uh, in our in our first in our first full year, um, we uh, grew about which was last year. Um, we launched in middle of two thousand and eight, and our first, we grew about four hundred percent. But we are and we're growing about fifteen to twenty percent a month, which is not quite hockey stick. Um, and we're certainly much smaller than Evite, um, but uh, I'm pretty satisfied with our trajectory. So you know the application is viral in a sense, or sorry, that's actually technically a misnomer. Um, it self-markets itself because one person uses it and 40 or 50 people will get the invitation and then hopefully yeah. um, you don't suck, they like the experience and they'll go back and use you when they have an event. So it, that if you can get a little initial usage um, and your application is good, um, then uh, it at, at some point starts to grow itself. So that's, that's nice from just a pure going to market and finding users, which is always the, the difficulty on the internet. Even if you have a great application, how do you get people to find you? Um, and so we're aided a little bit by just the nature of a one-to-many application. How much do the postal uh, uh, invitations cost? Uh, fifty plus postage, and we mail them and send them. I think that's real. I mean, that's reasonable. You I mean, if you, you'd never you get a card you for that. Use them for- you wouldn't use it for a wedding invite. It's not that level of quality, but right. you use it for your kid's birthday party. Um, right. you know, Boy, a lot party. easier. A lot easier. Yeah. Lot easier. And if you're buying a card at the at the card store, it's a buck fifty easily. So it's about that. Oh, and okay. uh, there's a unique unique URL on the bottom of it, so people can RSVP and go there, and it's unique for each one. And so it's it's kind of a, and it's pretty. I think it's. I think there isn't anyone else in the marketplace doing this integrated online and web like and offline like that. It's my guess that. Uh, People nowadays want to RSVP online. That that's kind of de rigueur, right? And you can see who it else is RSVP'd, and you know who's unless be there. unless you're in New York, where people don't RSVP out of principle to anything. <laughs> I I'll, you'll know I'm there when I show up. Right, and and I'm not going to let you know one way or the other. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's just, just actually, New York. That, that's just can, New York, though. But you can hide who is RSVP. I did that at my recent event because I feel like sometimes with Evites, people just keep checking back in to see how many people are going. Right. And I thought, I don't even want to get in on that game. So I just hid the whole RSVP list on Ping, which was a really oh, nice feature. Smart. So you couldn't see that at all. So that's an option as well. I mean, no one knows how popular or unpopular you really <laughs> exactly. are. Exactly. Exactly. like that. Is there a mobile app for this? So... For you can use us if you receive an invitation on your iPhone or your BlackBerry. You can RSVP and get the event details. And in fact, the event details are in the email themselves. So you, in fact, don't have, actually have to go to a website, um, unlike uh, some of the, the other services. Um, from a creating an event, uh, we haven't created an iPhone app specifically for that because it's a pretty visual application at the start. In other words, you're looking at a lot of uh, graphically intense mm-hmm. um, images and then customizing it and picking fonts. So I don't think we're going to create one to actually make an event, but maybe to manage an event. So there you go. Host when you're on, and so you can see who I'm yeah, repeat. So maybe, you know, uh, you'll have an iPhone app where you can check in on your event, see who's RSVP, maybe add a couple people, send those out again. But I think you need some screen real estate to do the visual part of the application. And you do integrate with Twitter, Facebook, uh, even text messages. We do. You, you can send your event uh, to your Facebook friends. Um, you can send it out a lot. Of, you know, if you go to Twitter and type in ping.com, like if you just do a Twitter search right now and then you type in ping, you'll see a bunch of people who even aren't even emailing their events out anymore. They're just posting them to Twitter and then have people RSVP that way. So <laughs> just type in ping and you'll start to see a bunch of events. You know, That's hysterical. And, uh, you know, you can event stock and go to some of them. So we make that easy. Um, well, that's and, a way uh, to invent, invite people. Uh, just put the ping uh, URL. I wanted to start a reality show that was uh, event, you know, like uh, the wedding crashers, but event, like event crashers. crashers. And, you know, I like it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I was, Look at this. You can hire so us. You can just see. Right. So. So you, yeah, that's your next, your that's next a, TV show. That's a very interesting <laughs> use of uh, Twitter is to, for invites like that. Wow. So, yeah, and that's uh, um, not one, again, that we, you know, had thought of until I started seeing that activity where people were cutting and pasting links. 
So we just, you know, they have a pretty open API and it's easy and it's easy to integrate with them relatively. So it's good. Cool. Well, well, thanks for joining us. It's uh, good. Hopefully people can try it out and see if they like it more than Evite. Although I will say from firsthand experience, I'm sure they will. So <laughs> good job on all you guys have done. It's good to, good to see you again. And uh, thanks for having me on the show. Thanks, Lorian. P-I-N-G-G dot com. Send art, invite online, free online invitations and announcements. Great to talk to you, Lorian. Good luck. Stay out of trouble, guys. Take yeah. care. <laughs> thanks. You too. Yeah. See you later. Bye -bye. Good luck doing that. That's neat. Yeah, it's a great, great, uh, it's an awesome service. Once you start using it, you just want to have more events all the time. <laughs> yeah. Are you having a lot of parties lately? I guess when you have a, a one-year-old, you start having yeah. parties all the time, right? I just did, I did a book launch in Toronto. Uh, so I organized the whole thing on Ping. And it was funny because I was going to use Evite. And then Chris looked at me and said, don't use Evite. That's so 1999. <laughs> and I'm thinking, okay, I'm supposed to know more about this stuff than you do. And then he told me about Ping. And I thought, okay, I was really skeptical. And I started to use it. And I just thought for anyone who's managing events, it's just it's just nicer than Evite. It just, it uh, it's seamless. It's uh, simple to use. And uh, I think people would just love it. A lot of features that we would want today. You know, I, I, you know, I think he, he found out about it because he's a photographer and there's a lot of, uh, yeah. of photography stuff on this as well. There really and is. And you can put yeah. your own images in. We should, we should. Yeah, yeah, that. you can put in your own images. Yeah. So it takes like, just a couple minutes to set up a, a party and plan it and, and do all of that fun stuff. Coming up, our video of the week and a way to make Twitter more colorful. But first, time to tell you about go to assist. Dot com from the great folks at Citrix. Go to Assist Express is the easy way to support family and friends if you're in the IT business. If you've got software to support, it's a must. It is simply the best way. I did it again with my mom. Uh, I had changed her email address. and She said, uh, my email's not coming in on my, uh, on my Apple Mail. I said, no problem. I sent her the link. She clicks the link. She... <laughs> Mom's funny. She likes to watch as I fix her computer. She says, oh, the mouse is moving. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> and you can chat. But really, Go to Assist Express is designed for power users, the, the support professional who might have as many as eight sessions going at once. Yes, you can. Unattended sessions, too. Um, you can share their screen, but you, they can share your screen. If you want to show them how something works, you can drag and drop files from your computer to theirs. So if mom has a virus problem or whatever, I can drag the fix over. Um, you can even see what's running on your uh, fixy, your supportees system, including operating system, background software, even security software. It's just got a lot of features for the support professional. I love the idea of having eight sessions at once so you can move boom, boom, boom right through them. Uh, but here's the best deal. Try it free for 30 days. Unlimited use. Go to Assist Express. Visit gotoassist.com slash night, N-I-G-H-T. G-O-T-O assist.com slash night. Mm. Citrix, uh, of course, is the best in remote access. Go to Assist Express, recently named the worldwide market leader in remote support by Frost and Sullivan. This is Ooh. their, yeah. Uh, it's, not, it's not a surprise to me. It's just so easy. And, you know, um, mom didn't have it installed. She had a new computer I hadn't worked on before. So uh, I sent her the link. She clicks it. I said, when it says allow, because she's on a Mac, by the way, Mac to PC, PC to Mac, PC to PC, any combination. I said, uh, okay, uh, you're going to see an allow box. Just click the allow, she does. And, uh, and then, it's, then, then I say, okay, start the session. And, and she gets a little message saying, you know, Leo would like to start a support session with you. She says, okay. And now I'm seeing your computer. And by the way, you know, sometimes you try these solutions and they're lagging and very slow. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is coast to coast. She's in Rhode Island. I'm in uh, California. No problem. It's easy. It's fast. I was able to uh, get her set up in seconds and uh, made her very happy. I want you to try it free. Go to assist.com slash night. 30 days absolutely free just for you. And if you forgot a forget Father's Day present, this would be a good one to make up to your dad oh, if yeah. he has tech problems. <laughs> yeah, just say, Dad, uh, I, I, I give you three free support calls. After that, it's $50 a call. <laughs> it's a gift that keeps on giving to you. Exactly. That. Hey, Those speaking of gifts, you know, this is a great gift. If Dad or Mom or anybody you know is in business and you want to know more about using social media to propel your business to the 21st century, Amber's new book, Power Friending. This is brand new. Just came out. You can get it on Amazon. It's from Portfolio. Just Google Power Friending and you can find out more. And it really, you, what I like about this, tons of case studies. 
So it's not yeah, it airy fairy. Here's the idea. It's case studies. This worked. This worked. This worked. This worked. How it, how they did it. What you should use. Yeah, what you could use. It's really a how to book. I mean, it really is there to teach people something. And I don't know. That's always been my approach. To, you know, ever since we started working together on Call for Help, because I love teaching people how to do things, and that's the whole premise of the book. Yeah. Hopefully that comes through. Yeah, it does. I you know it, it, I've read so many books that are abstract and theoretical, and this is very. Yeah. This is what you do. Especially when you get into the marketing world. I mean, they get pretty uh, pretty weak as far as having content. You know, right. it's the, all these ideas. All these and clever, like, clever. If you believe this, this will happen. Yeah, and it's exactly. kind of like the secret and you just want to kill yourself, right? right? So. Yep, yep, yep. yep. <laughs> this isn't about that. If you're no. looking for that type of book, you can look elsewhere. No, this, this is about is, reading it and then you can do something. This is, it's not a secret. This is how you do it. <laughs> yeah. Very simple. <laughs> No secrets here. So, Leo, do you have another show coming up in a few minutes? I do, but I think I have uh, plenty of time for... Oh, okay, good. Twimbo. What is Twimbo? <laughs> I just read about this on Mashable. This is kind of fun. Um, the idea is you have a colorful version of uh, a service that allows you to manage your Twitter account. It's kind of like TweetDeck, but uh, you color code things in the interface. And I will oh. say this is in pre-alpha, so not available right now. But you can change the color of a tweet. Um, you can add color tags. You can sort tweets by different colors and uh, it's being compared to how you use labels and folders in Gmail. So to really sort through all your information, but again, it's based on color. So I think people will like this, you know, if you're into color and this fun sort of thing, um, it's a different option than some of the other, uh, I guess, more stale uh, services out there to manage your Twitter account. I don't understand how they could not have invited us to be involved in this. I know. I well, feel the same. The thing about color is it's very quick. I, I, I've been using a lot of color in my email. In Gmail now yeah. allows you to do colored labels. And it really is quick. Yeah. In fact, that's uh, the place where I really am seeing this is in Gmail. I mean, I can see immediately what I've got. Um, so oh, it's what a fantastic. good idea. Yeah. Yeah. I have idea. to do the same thing with my Gmail. It's uh, to be able to organize everything and, and, you know, get to stuff quickly and figure out uh, what I need to sift through instead of reading through everything. We're in the same boat there. Okay, Leo, one more link, and then we have a video, which is kind of a video that I want to, I've been wanting to share with you now for a couple of weeks. Um, so this next link, I think you'll love this. I found it uh, originally on lifehacker.com. If you're a Tetris fan, and uh, I'm sure you are or have been at one point, then this is a link to a site that will give you packing tips from a Tetris master. <laughs> so uh, I thought it was just fun. And you know what? This is like, like I say, it just originally, um, I think it's on... Uh, a Kotaku, and I found it on Lifehacker, but so many great tips for actually packing up um, a car and how to fit things in, and I love this kind of stuff, and I think our audience does too. So, uh, what is the what is the website so I can uh, I can find this? I need this. Yeah, no problem. So if, if you check out, uh, it's here on Kotaku.com, but I found it on Lifehacker just uh, today. So uh, the list of packing tips from a Tetris master. Um, a few tips, for instance, uh, if you have a box that doesn't fit neatly, hold on to it and unhold it when uh, it won't mess everything up. The urge to simply cram everything into the back of a truck as quickly as possible is strong, but don't My force dad it. taught me that. He said it's like a Chinese puzzle. Yeah, yeah. I don't know if you know what a Chinese puzzle is, but the, it's getting all the pieces back. And it's exactly right. You can't, you, you've got to think about it a little bit. Yeah, I think it's hysterical it's, that a guy who's, who's played Tetris. <laughs> he's like a Tetris master Tet and he's giving all these tips. It's Tetris hilarious. would be the perfect tool for learning how to pack. Yeah, and it talks about long boxes. I mean, there's all this lingo for people who are packing geeks. Don't waste your long boxes because I guess those are very valuable to be able to fit into those long, narrow spaces. Uh, and it That's goes so on funny. and on. John Tran, he's 25 years old. He's uh, from Menifee, California, and he's a Tetris master. And he, they know because he's on the leaderboards at uh, Tetris Friends. Uh, dot com, and he also has a Tetris community site of his very own. This is hysterical. So look funny. ahead. He says, look ahead. Well, that's a Tetris rule. <laughs> yeah. Avoid creating it, unnecessary gaps. Yeah, of course. Leave an empty column open. Don't waste your long boxes. You were saying that. Multiplayer will help you reach a faster time. So have some family and friends to help you out. <laughs> so you like turn it into a game. And I love that idea. Yeah. He says, I think Tetris teaches you patience and how to plan ahead in real life, just like you do in the game. Thank you, John Tran, for your packing tips. See, nowadays, Dad would have said it's just like Tetris, not like a Chinese puzzle. It's just like Tetris. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Same idea.
<laughs> the new age way of explaining it. Uh, okay, Leo. So uh, before we wrap the show, I just wanted to mention that a couple of weeks ago, I told you uh, Chris and I were working on a video for my book launch, and uh, we were taking the opening of Dexter, which I love. I love the oh, show. Oh, you're such a Dexter fanatic. I know, and we have recreated the entire no. opening. Yes, and you know what? The funny thing is, I know for people listening in, it's going to be hard to visualize, but we'll try to talk through it a little bit. The okay. whole video is called Texter, and basically I'm recreating the opening of Dexter piece by piece, but I'm using technology as part of my life. Oh. And uh, there's a cameo, Leo, by you at the end, so this is why it's appropriate, and I need to I need to share it with you. Well, I'm not, this, everybody has seen it already. I'm the last to see this, of course. So you go to <laughs> YouTube and search for Texter, uh, and you can find it. And uh, and don't forget, you can find Amber Mack all over the place. AmberMack.com is her website. Uh, you can watch her on CommandN.tv, her great video podcast every week. Of course, our show, Net at Night, we do this every Tuesday afternoon at 1.30 Pacific. Uh, that's uh, 4.30 Eastern Time, uh, 20.30 UTC, live.twit.tv. Her book, brand new, Power Friending, just out from Portfolio. And here is the promo <laughs> for Power Friending, Texter. <laughs> if you've watched a lot of Dexter, you'll immediately recognize this. Yeah. Even to the drops of blood. Oh, yeah. Oh, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> wow. He really worked hard on this. Yeah, we shot him on the Canon T2i. Really? Oh, it's nail polish, not blood. But... No. <laughs> Slicing the bacon, texting it. You're going to love the next part. Eating it. Oh, cracking an egg over an iPhone. Is that the one I gave you? <laughs> yes, it is, Leo. <laughs> yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> How'd you know? I just had a feeling. Oh. This is so good. Did you have to just go shot by shot and... Uh... Yeah. Wow. Chris did a ton of work. He actually... He uh, must have storyboarded it. Yeah, every single scene. And wow. then we found ideas that kind of fit for that. It took us so long to shoot, you have no idea. It was... Will it blend? Yes, it blends. <laughs> it was really intense. Like, the, I mean, hours. And it's a good thing we get along well because... Uh, oh, this <laughs> a is a fight in the shots, making. You know? Yeah. yeah. Like, get out of my fish. Shave your leg again. Do it differently. Yeah, yeah, Do great. it this way. Do it one more time. Hey, there I am. She closes the lid. <laughs> That's so cute. Isn't that great? Amber, nice job. I love that. Available now. Amazon.com. Borders. Barnes & Noble. We had to fit you in. We are like, we got to get Leo into this. I love it that you shot that on the T2i. No. Um, it's impressive. At 720p, uh, it just looks, it's, it's high def. It's beautiful. It's amazing. It's really beautiful. Yeah. yeah. I don't know if I'll be doing another one for a while, but uh, we're good <laughs> this <laughs> Amber Mac, AmberMac.com, and uh, we'll see you next week for another okay, Leo, thrilling, gripping you. edition of Texter, a.k.a. Net at Night. See you, Amber. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>